Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Cameron Moore, and we're back again live from MCC headquarters. And as always, we want to thank you for carving out a little time today to join us for our sixth and second to last mini webby. In today's webinar, presented by Desiree Tristy Aragon, a Community Cat Program Manager at Best Friends Animal Society, we're going to examine exactly how Albuquerque drastically reduced their intake and euthanasia of cats and kittens. Before we dive in, I just want to give a quick reminder that we try very hard to honor our commitment to deliver these webinars in under 30 minutes. So to stay on track, we queue questions until the end of the presentation, at which time we'll have a short Q&A session. That said, you don't need to wait until the end to ask. Go ahead and submit your questions as they come to you. There's a Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen, and you can just type in your question. Don't be shy. If you're thinking it, someone else probably is too. So let's dive right in. Desiree is the Community Cat Program Manager for Best Friends Animal Society. She's overseeing community cat programs in cities across the country, including Tucson, Arizona, Las Vegas, Nevada, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and many others. These programs are public-private partnerships with local municipal shelters that aim to humanely reduce the population of free-roaming cats. Since the start of these programs, municipal shelters have seen a dramatic reduction in intake of cats and kittens. Desiree is currently working on a shelter-based community cat program around the country that focuses on return to field, proactive community outreach, and progressive shelter policies. So Desiree, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Cameron, and hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having me speak today. I can talk about community cats all day long, so I am super, super excited to be here. So let's go ahead and, and get started and just go ahead and jump right into the Albuquerque program. So the Best Friends uh, PetSmart Charities Community Cat Program in Albuquerque it was from 2012 to 2015. Um, Albuquerque is New Mexico's largest municipal shelter. At the time, we were taking in about 25,000 uh, cats and dogs per year. Uh, return to field programs are becoming a lot more common nowadays, but at the time, this was pretty unchartered territory for us. So in the three years of the program, uh, we sterilized about 12,000 cats, um, and that's from both uh, field uh, TNR cats and also the shelter return to field cats. And at the shelter level, euthanasia went down by 84%, and the intake of cats and kittens decreased by 37%. It was just amazing. We've been able to maintain about a 90% live release rate for the last several years. So if it can happen in New Mexico, it can happen in any community. I always refer to return to field as game changer programs because that's exactly what they are. They can quickly cha change the landscape, not only for community cats, but they benefit other populations in the shelter, such as dogs or neonate kittens, by freeing up space and resources at the shelter. The next few slides will have several statistics and graphs. Uh, these come from an article that my coworker, Peter Wolf, uh, co-authored, and it was actually published this last April. If you're interested in learning more about the Albuquerque program, there'll be a link at the end of the presentation. I will say that I think that these peer review papers are really good to have available when you're trying to make a case to a municipality that currently does not have a return to field or a TNR program. So just some more statistics on Albuquerque at the shelter level. Um, you'll see that we had, just in terms of raw numbers, we had intake of um, and euthanasia decrease in the hundreds and in the thousands of cats. And while there are just numbers that are listed here, I do always try to remember the phrase that each number is a whisker. So all of these cats that were part of the program, they all have their own individual personalities, and they all wanted to live their own lives. What you'll notice at the top of this chart is um, that about 90% of the cats that came through our program were actually returned to field. Um, so we stayed very, very focused um, on that mission. We did adopt out about 1,000 of them, but it should be noted that the bulk of the program, um, or I'm sorry, that should be noted that the bulk of the cats that we adopted out was really at the end of the program when we felt that the city had capacity and we weren't taking an adoptable home 
from a cat that did not have other options. So about 8% of them went to adoption, but I should note that I, I do feel that that number is a little bit high. Um, I would have actually preferred to see that number hover around 5%. We rarely relocated cats, so through the whole program, only about six. So the question for us really became, how do you provide good customer service for somebody who's expecting the cats to be removed? For purposes of the case study paper, Albuquerque is broken out into four phases. Um, and what you'll notice on this slide is you'll see a kind of continual downward trend on both intake and euthanasia. So starting from phase one in 2008 and 2010, um, the city had started, um, they discontinued public trap rentals, they discontinued animal control officer field pickups. The city also started subsidizing surgeries um, and the co-payments for caregivers, and then they started referring TNR jobs to local rescue groups. Phase two was from 2011 to about March 2012. And at that time, the city became, began a pilot return to field program, and that was really just for feral cats. It was very under the radar. Returns were done at night in volunteer vehicles. Um, and I should note, too, that at this time, there wasn't a targeted trapping component, so intake went up just a little bit, about 1% during this time. So phase three, um, that's um, the portion that I became involved in, um, and that's what I'll continue to talk about for the rest of this presentation. Um, that was the Best, uh, Best Friends PetSmart Charities grant period, so from 2012 to 2015. And what that grant did is it combined the field TNR, the shelter return to field, and proactive community outreach. Phase four is where we're at right now, and that's really the sustainability piece. Um, a local nonprofit, Street Cat Hub, um, now has the city contract to provide return to field and TNR services. Um, and again, that we um, have still been able to maintain that 90% live release rate for cats. So it's, Super exciting. Just another slide to just to show the intakes and the euthanasia continue to decrease um, during the Best Friends Pet Smart Charities portion um, of the program. What you'll notice too in this chart is that the vast majority of surgeries were actually in the field versus in the shelters. So most of the work that was being done was out in the community. When the program first started, we really wanted intake staff to have conversations with the public that were bringing in the cats, but it just didn't happen. So we had to come up with a workaround. So what our workaround was is we pulled intake lists every day from Chameleon and we cold call people. So for example, if just looking at this sheet, if you brought in um, cats uh, from a major cross street, you didn't live, uh, list the exact address, we gave you a call. If you brought in kittens with no mom, we gave you a call. So we knew that those people who were bringing in kittens were going to be guaranteed intakes next year. So that right there was our first focus for reduction. Our second focus in intake was um, to then uh, use targeted trapping from these same lists. So I know a lot of people will focus on zip codes, but I really, really felt that that was just too broad. So what I did instead was I pulled a list every year of the top 10 addresses that cats were impounded, and that was where I worked my list for outreach. And to be honest, it was a pretty easy conversation to have. So we would call somebody and be like, you know, hey, you've been bringing in cats to the shelter. Can you let me know a little bit more about what's going on in your neighborhood and how we can help? It was so important to not only listen to people, but also to remove the barriers um, from what was preventing them to getting these cats fixed. So was it transportation? Was it flexibility in surgery scheduling? So we tried to remove those barriers as much as we could. And just to reiterate a little bit more on that focused targeting. Um, in total, for the three years of the program, we trapped in about 22 zip codes 
But what you'll notice is about 70% of the cats that actually came through the program were within those uh, same six zip codes. Just a reminder, we everybody, to get your questions in. Sorry, Desiree. We saw, oh, no worries. So we also saw the importance of consistent messaging. Um, so what we started to do was we have the City 311 dispatch give out our phone number for any cat-related calls. But I do also feel that people may only call one time. Um, so expecting somebody to call 311 and then to call us might be act might be asking for a little bit too much. So um, again, that's where that proactive outreach came in again, so we would call them. Those 311 operators were provided with basic scripts, but then we followed up from there. Um, I, I do feel that it's really helpful for someone to hear um, the same message from 311, they hear it from us, and they'll also hear it from other rescue groups. So every single time that they called somebody, they would hear that TNR was the option. But again, we also made sure that we coupled that conversation with really good customer service to let the public know that we were there to help them. Albuquerque has two big, amazing, beautiful shelters, and they have a, a nice budget. Um, but when I've taken folks from other cities to do a tour, one of the things I hear a lot of is, well, you know, our shelter doesn't have resources like this. And the, the truth of the matter is we, we really didn't either we operated almost completely outside of the shelter um, and we partnered with a private nonprofit in order to do this. So the site here, it shows a, it's a little converted house. Um, it's about 600 square feet um, and 4,000 cats come through here every year. Um, so we did it with three sets of shelves. So those um, metal shelves, we had uh, one for incoming cats, um, and then the other ones were for outgoing cats, um, cats waiting for surgery. And we also had one set of shoreline cages for cats that needed extended medical holding. So that was it. That was all the um, room that we had, but we made it work. And that's actually the, the end of my spiel. So we can certainly take any questions. Excellent, Desiree. Thank you so much. So um, I'm curious how the staff reacted when you started this program and then what happened after best friends left i know like in jacksonville here initially our shelter staff was afraid to talk to people about this program they thought they were going to hate them and they were going to yell at them and and then once we've been doing it for so many years all of a sudden they were like well of course this is how we do things and so they they were very proud of the program and from this point on they can totally talk to the public so did did the same kind of thing happen in albuquerque and what have they done since best friends has left Absolutely, yeah. I think it was the same fear, um, and especially you're thinking back in you know, 2011 and 2012, these programs were so new, so there wasn't a whole lot of other examples that we could pull from, from successful return to field programs that had been doing it at this level. Um, I do feel that at the time, the intake staff was really kind of risk adverse, and they were really scared to have those conversations with the public. They didn't, um, they were almost afraid to tell people no. Um, and I do feel that for a long time we weren't very transparent with the public and that we deceived the public in the sense that, you know, we would, we as in the shelter, we would tell people in the community, our shelter doesn't euthanize for space, right? So if somebody would bring in a cat to the shelter, they'd be like, oh yeah, we're going to find a home for that cat. We're going to adopt that cat out. But in reality, what would happen is we would hold that cat, we would hold him for an extended period of time, he would get stressed, he would get sick. And then we would medically euthanize that cat for being sick. So in reality, what we were doing is we were euthanizing cats for space. So I, I feel like for us, those initial steps with intake and having those conversations with the public and getting the staff comfortable with it were, were super scary. And I, I think that process certainly did take, take a long time. Um, one of the things I recommend now when I'm working in shelters is to have a really well-crafted intake form um, to be able to help guide those conversations. So you want to, of course, be able to provide intake with as much training as possible, but if they can have an intake sheet that has all of the information about the program on it, I think they can use that as a guide um, to be able to have those conversations um, in a little bit more confident manner. 
That's fantastic, Desiree. I wonder if maybe you could share a sample of that and then we can add that to the widget so people can look at it later. Um, so oh, here's, here's another question for you. How can shelters build in the capacity to keep going with the program once the grant period is over? Um, this, this person says, I believe that Albuquerque's cat intake has been bumping back up over the last couple of years as they were not able to maintain the high level of surgeries after the grant period ended. Yeah, so in terms of sustainability for, for Albuquerque, we've still stayed at an intake level that's um, at the baseline for when the program ended. So the private nonprofit has actually taken over um, and they have the city contract. So we were able to have such good statistics that the city was able to then make a really good pitch to build it into their budget and to continue to fund the program. So the intake has stayed the same from their baseline year, which would have been 2015. Um, I mentioned earlier in the presentation that about 8% of kittens were pulled for adoptions and that I would prefer to see that um, hover around 5%. And I think what I'm seeing now with the way the program has evolved is I feel like that they're pulling a little bit more for adoption. Um, my preference is always if a cat has a good outcome back home, he should go back out. So if he's you know, friendly or if he's feral, I always advocate to put that cat back in his community and he can go back to the environment where he lives. Um, so I think there's a, a little bit of kind of a, a disconnect there in terms of intake now. Um, but in terms of surgery capacity, we have one um, high volume clinic here that's been able to maintain the surgery capacity since 2012. That's excellent. And if anybody um, was not able to catch Shelly Simmons' webinar last week, she also talked about in her shelter at Greenville County Animal Care how after the grant period had ended, they were able to continue this program internally because the number of cats coming into their shelter had dramatically decreased. And they were able to do this um, with it being budget neutral. So um, definitely you can go and listen to that webinar later. Now here's another question for you. Um, how did you get more vets involved in spay neuter? Um, we are limited by appointments available. Yeah, and I feel that in every community, including Albuquerque and everyone that I'm in now, surgery capacity um, is, is a main hurdle. I think with the surgery capacity that we had, we were definitely we definitely had to stay as focused as possible and make sure that we were getting cats that were impactful at the shelter level. Um, we were very fortunate that we have one very high volume clinic and that's actually who we were able to use almost exclusively. Um, at the time, the shelter didn't have the capacity to perform the surgeries in house, but we were slowly able to kind of transition to where they were doing more and more. Um, and, and again, I think it's just capacity and resources. So um, as intake goes down in the shelter, um, you know, there's less cats entering in. I think then that frees up the vet staff to be able to, to do more surgeries. Right, right. Um, we have another question um, that says, thanks for all you do. Help is desperately needed in Mason, Texas. There is no low-cost spay-neuter clinic, and the two rescues there at this time are not very helpful in a TNR program, but animal control is. It's a two-hour drive for me one way to get the cat, bring them back to be spay-neutered, and then take them back. How can I get a program started there and get some help? Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I neglected to put in my slides is my contact information. Um, so if anybody is interested in just kind of more information with what I'm doing right now for uh, with shelter grants and shelter outreach, definitely um, send me an email. It's uh, Desiree T at bestfriends.org. So D-E-S-I-R-E-E -E -E, uh, T at bestfriends.org. And again, I, I think with surgery capacity, I, I think there are times where we've had to be pretty creative. We have one mentorship uh, shelter that we're working with that's super rural. Um, there just isn't the shelters or there just isn't vets available. So what we've had, had to do for them is we contracted with a mobile clinic that's about, oh gosh, three hours away um, to at least help alleviate uh, some of that surgical load. So that was kind of our kind of stopgap for that. But it's not 
an end-all be-all solution, but at least it kind of gets the ball rolling and is able to, to get cats fixed in the meantime until we can come up with a more sustainable solution. Of course, and we saw the same thing too up in northern Kentucky where we were working with eight rural counties and um, they did not have the high volume spay neuter clinic um, right in their backyard. So um, besides doing those long distance transports, they did invite every veterinarian in those counties to participate in offering surgeries. And you know, most said no, but some said yes. And those who did were a super help to that community. And then as the program gained success, other vets said, hey, we could we could jump in on this, you know, and, and help out. So don't be afraid to ask for help from whatever asset or resource you have around you. You know, all the worst they can say is no. All right, so next question has to do with that 311. Um, so did 311, um, take all the calls for the shelter, or is it just was it just like a city hotline or a county hotline? Like, yeah, did they no, have a script that they would follow? Mm -hmm. They did have a script we could follow, um, and if anyone needs assistance with that, we do have templates um, for 311 kind of talking scripts. But yeah, our our 311 line is for everything, so potholes and graffiti or barking dogs. It's just kind of the catch-all of city services. So we did provide them a talking script and then as well as our phone number. We did have to tweak it several times because what was happening is we would get calls for a rabbit running loose or for, you know, we started to get a little too many calls. So we did try to focus them. If it was a stray cat, um, you know, we wanted that call. And then did you also have handouts that you left in the community after releasing the cats to try to educate the neighbors about uh, what to do if they see cats outside? We did, yeah. We have door hangers um, that we would provide that we would um, when we were doing outreach in the community as well as flyers. And I think um, I'm a big fan of the door hangers. I think the best um, the way to reach people is really just to actually knock on their doors and get somebody to talk to it. There wasn't a whole lot of follow through. I felt if I would just leave the door hanger with our phone number. Um, but when I would actually knock on the door and talk to somebody, it was so much more effective. All right, so we have a next question. We are a spay-neuter clinic, which also provides resources for residents to safely and affordably TNR community cats. A large barrier so far has been getting support from a couple of major shelters here in our area for TNR and return to field. Do you have any advice? Oh, I'm sorry, there's a slight gap in my, my phone. Can you repeat that question? Sure, sure. So this comes from a spay-neuter clinic in Iowa who provides resources for residents to safely and affordably TNR community cats. But one of their large barriers so far has been getting support from a couple of major shelters here in, in their area for TNR and RTF. Do you have any advice? Ah, gotcha. Thank you. Um, you know, so much of these programs is relationship building. Um, I, I really advocate meeting people where they are. And I think so much of it, if you're as a spay neuter group or if you're a clinic or a rescue group, is really meeting with your shelter where they're at and approaching them in that non-judgmental way and really offering resources to help. Um, I, I think there traditionally has been a lot of distrust between different organizations in a community. So I, I think having that capacity building and that relationship building is so, so important. Um, just to even start that process. I think if you can come in and you've done your research on the shelter, um, pull the data, learn what the most at-risk populations are in the shelter, learn you know, basically how you can be the most helpful, I think is gonna be um, the most impactful. Like where are the cats that are dying? Which is the population that's at risk? Um, and then also being able to provide good statistics from other communities that have done it, um, I think is also really helpful. Excellent. And so one more question from Karen at Bikini Beach Cat Rescue. Do you have a spay-neuter grant for small organizations who only do spay-neuter clinics in TNR? Yeah, so Best Friends has several different grant opportunities. Um, we also have our network grants. I believe we have another cycle opening up within the next um, few months. I think we have another, we have one or two cycles per year. Um, the grants that I focus on really are uh, shelter-based because I think those are the most impactful in terms of the cats that are at risk in the community. 
But um, certainly do send me an email because I can probably direct you to, to other grants. I know Maddie's Fund does some grants um, and kind of give you a list of maybe other avenues to start, um, even also with local donors in your own community. Excellent. So if anybody has any last minute questions, we're getting near the end, so go ahead and get those in. Um, before we go, I just want to remind everybody to take a quick look at that green widget there on your screen. Um, there's only one Webby left in this series, so make sure you don't miss our final discussion about CARE2 programs. What is a CARE2 program? You'll have to tune in next week to find out. Um, there, don't forget, in that widget, you will also see other resources like the link to that TNR study that Desiree mentioned. So it's got a lot of really useful information there. Um, so do we have any last minute questions? Anything else you want to say, Desiree? Um, yeah, I'll give a quick plug to, if you go to the Best Friends website, we do have a Community Cat Program handbook. Um, it does actually uh, also have the stray cat intake form on there, um, but it's got all sorts of different resources on how to start these programs and uh, things that come up, common issues, budget stuff. So it's got kind of a scoop to nuts um, how to start these programs. So um, that's always a resource that I direct folks to. That is so amazing. And the good thing for everybody listening to this is that today in 2018, you're not trying to ask your community to do a program that no one's ever done before. So the, the really, really amazing thing is that there are so many other communities who've gone before you. So we have resources now. We have other communities we can talk to. You have forms already filled out. You've got um, programs already laid out so you're not recreating the wheel. So this is really, really neat. And again, when I started our program in Jacksonville in 2008, I wish I had had that. So. Um, and like Desiree said too, you know, even in 2011 and 12, it was still pretty scary because we didn't have a whole lot of, of info under our belt. But now you can just, it doesn't matter if you're talking to a commissioner or a shelter director or the health department, we have really good information at our fingertips now. And Best Friends is amazing at providing help with community cats. So don't be afraid to reach out to Desiree and her team because they are a wealth of information. So it doesn't look like we have any more questions, but before we go, we can't sign off without sending a huge thanks to Maddie's Fund for their continued support and for sharing this platform with us so we can be here with you today talking about cats, which is our most favorite topic. And um, speaking of cats, we want you to have a safe and delicious happy Halloween. So goodbye, everybody.